might be something this way. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, welcome. Uh, it's so good to see uh, each and every one of you uh, here this morning. Uh, Don is away today. He's uh, had a prior commitment that he made uh, 18 months ago. He's taken part in the 60th anniversary at one of his churches in the SBCV. So we miss him today, and um, we ask him to pray for uh, safe travels for him and uh, for that church for being around for 60 years and making an impact in their community. Uh, so this morning we have Chuck Garner that will be giving the, uh, the sermon here today. We're excited to have church Chuck here with us. <laughs> He'll give a little bit more detailed uh, intro to himself uh, before uh, he uh, gives us his uh, sermon. So uh, he's a friend of Don. Uh, I guess I was a little surprised Don had friends. So... Uh, <clears throat> So uh, that, that's good to know. So uh, you might, you know, you get an achievement award for being friends with Don. So we'll be sure to tell him that. So, uh, so it's great to see each and every one of you all this morning. Uh, we look forward to uh, our day of worship here today. So let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this uh, wonderful Sunday morning that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for this honor and privilege to be in your house here today to worship you. Lord God, just... Um, Thank you for these people that are here today. Just pray, Lord, that uh, your spirit moves through us. Just uh, lift Chuck up to you as you be with him this morning, the message that you've laid on his heart to give us here today that we hear. Father, we just ask you to be with Don as, as he's uh, traveling back and forth and to his, their church. We just thank you for that church that's been around for 60 years and making an impact in their community, Lord. Father, we thank you for this church and this body of believers here today that we've gathered here to worship you and glorify you and exalt your name. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your son, a savior, Lord, name above all names. We thank you, Lord, for the cross and an empty tomb, creating the perfect plan, Lord, that we may have life. Father, just be with us now as we uh, bring this worship service to you. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. If you could stand, um, we'll start off our service this morning with some songs. And actually, we're going to I'm going to read Psalm 8 to, to get us started this morning. Um, this morning we're going to have psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs like we're instructed to, right? So Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes. Still, to, to, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, can you say it with me? How majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's sing together. Lord, as we enter your sanctuary, prepare our hearts, knowing that you withheld nothing to set us apart. Let our hearts rejoice, let our praise resound, for you, our Lord, let us not withhold our joyful sound. Before your throne above, O King of love. Lord, as we enter your sanctuary, prepare our hearts. Knowing that you withheld nothing to set us apart. Let our hearts rejoice, let our praise resound. For you, our Lord, let us not withhold our joyful sound before your throne above, O King of love. Create in me a clean heart, 
cast me not away. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore my joy today. Create in me a clean heart. Cast me not away. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore my joy today. Let our hearts rejoice. Let our praise resound for you, our Lord. Let us not withhold our joyful sound before your throne above. Let our hearts rejoice. Let our praise resound for you, our Lord. Let us not withhold our joyful sound before your throne above, O King of commands all the host of heaven who else can make every king bow down who else can whisper in darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises what other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only Christ. Sing holy forever a holy God. Come and worship a holy God. What other glory consumes like fire? What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only Christ. forever a holy God. Come and worship a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy forever. and worship a holy God. Who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him Father? Only a holy God, only my holy God. Come and behold him, the one. Worship. 
worship the holy God. Come and behold the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy forever a holy God. Come and worship the What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange, how divine, I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is Dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won. I shall, I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread. I know I am forgiven, the future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning to sing songs to you, to hear a psalm. Lord, I just pray that you would prepare our hearts for your word. And Lord, I know that there are many requests here today. There are many hearts that are in need to hear from you and need a touch from you this morning. And Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our midst today. Lord, draw us near to you and help us to draw close to you. And Lord, I know that you will draw near to us. And Lord, we do just repeat, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we honor you this morning and we bow our knee to you alone in Jesus' name. All right. Good morning, Fort Lewis. Hey, thanks. As uh, Sean said, my name is Chuck, and apparently I'm one of Don's friends. So <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad he, he qualifies me as that. I definitely think highly of him. I know Don because I am a former SBCV church planner and pastor. Um, and ironically, the our church plant actually met right next door to you for a couple of years in the Glenver Mini Mart before it became a Domino's. Uh, so anyway, we, we're, I'm very familiar with Fort Lewis. I now help Don by going around, filling in for people, preaching when somebody's out, or if, they just, or if a church doesn't have a pastor. That's my, my blessing. God gets to use me that way. And uh, when I'm not doing that, I actually work at Glenver High School. I'm the person that no teacher wants to see in the springtime because I'm in charge of all the SOL testing and they don't like seeing me come. Uh, but they're nice about it. And I just want to tell you, my son who's here, he goes to Glenver. You guys, Fort Lewis, you guys have a great name in this community. Um, people know you. People know what you do. People know the fifth quarter is awesome. My son's gone to that before. They, he loves it. He speaks highly of it. And uh, not to mention, like, the, the child care that you guys offer, the after-school care. It's just this amazing thing. You guys, I hope you realize the ministries that you're doing are making a difference. So I know this Friday night, I don't know if you know this, it's homecoming at Glenver. Uh, if all the Highlanders will be coming back, I know you have a fifth quarter plan for this Friday. If you're available to help at all, I encourage you to do that because it definitely makes a difference. So if anything else you want to know about me, just... Ask me later. Uh, very excited to see some people from my former church here. It means a lot. And uh, I'm excited to be here with you today and to share with you what I learned this week. And when I was growing up a long time ago, I was told, a long time ago when I was growing up, uh, yeah, uh, I'm about to turn 45 this week. Still dealing with that. It's okay, though. It, it, it's a good thing. Uh, I was told long ago when I was growing up, that you can either be an Elvis fan or a Beatles fan, but you can't be both. Oh, I got an amen already. Um, I don't know if this is true because I came to the Beatles very late in life. My, I was raised by a diehard Elvis fangirl and a Vietnam veteran who had no use for rock music and only wanted to listen to country. So I, didn't, I came to the Beatles very late in life, but regardless of what you think of them and their talent, you cannot deny the influence the Beatles had on popular music. But by the summer of 1968, cracks were starting to form, both in their personal lives and in the band itself. They were on the brink of breaking up. And it's ironic that at this moment, they actually wrote a song that became their biggest hits. It's the one that, I mean, it's... I don't know if it's their best song. I'll leave Beatles fans to debate that. But I can say that it stayed on the charts at number one longer than any other song. Now, I know there's some Beatles fans here. Do you know what song I'm talking about? That's right. You got it. Hey, Jude. Hey, Jude. Now, you say, why am I bringing that up? Well, I did an informal research poll this week, very informal. I asked people, what do you think of, what's the first thing you think of when you hear Jude? And guess what they said? No, they didn't say it. They started singing, hey, Jude, don't be, I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to subject you to that. I'll leave the music to other more talented people. And what a blessing it was to, to hear that music this morning. Um, I'm not criticizing this. Hey, Jude is a very popular song. And hardly anybody that I asked that to responded with, oh, well, that's a book in the Bible. 
Did you know there's a book in the Bible? I'm not, no judgment if you don't know there's a book in the Bible because a lot of people don't. Even people that go to church, there are some of you that maybe have never read Jude. It's not, it wasn't a huge hit. I mean, it wasn't. It was kind of late to the canonization of Scripture. Um, it's only one chapter long, and it's right before Revelation. And let's just be honest, when people read the Bible, they kind of, Revelation kind of overshadows the end of the Bible, so they kind of just skim over Jude. But I encourage you not to, because there is a lot of truth in the book of Jude. It was written in hopes of offering an alternative to division and strife, kind of like the song um, that the Beatles wrote. So today we're going to see what Jude has to say. And, but before we dive in, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for me. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for God to show us how we can take a sad song and make it better. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you so much for bringing us here today. Thank you for the opportunity to meet the freedom that we have to meet and open and public. Lord, I pray we don't take that for granted. Thank you, Lord, for Fort Lewis Baptist Church, for the ministry that they do for this community. I pray that you will bless this church and continue for them to grow in your mission to reach everyone in Glenver and Salem and beyond. Lord, I pray you'd be with us today. We've already worshipped you through Psalms. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When we consider everything you've done, the wonders of your creation, where we could be, we could fall in the trap and say, what are we? What are, like the psalmist says, what are humans that you would even think about us? But Lord, we know that you think about us. We know that you love us. You've revealed yourself to us through creation. You've revealed yourself to us through your word. And now, Lord, I pray that as we go and we study your word today in this short time that we have together, that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts to be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Jesus, our Savior, our Lord. In your holy name I pray. Amen. So we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 25. It's, there's no chapter because it's, it's just one chapter. Uh, it's in the New Testament. Like I said, it's right at the end of your Bible. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them and read along with me. I'll be using the ESV translation, which is what Pastor Don has been using. If you don't have them, I think they will be on the screen over there. And if you would like a Bible that's the ESV translation that Don's been using, and maybe you don't have one, I brought some for you. There's six right here. If you need more, let me know. I've got a box at the house. They are my gift to you for allowing me to be here with you. And it's large print. Because I need large print. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's good stuff. So, if you want one, grab one, please, and, and, and enjoy that. So, let's, look, let's read this together. We're going to be in verses 17 through 25. This is what Jude says. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in, most, in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire, and to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment that is stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. I could probably stop right now and just walk off. Because what Jude's writing is pretty good, especially the ending right there. That's one of the most famous benedictions. You might not know the book of the Bible. You, Jude was the book of the Bible, but you've probably heard this benediction before because there's so much truth to that. But this passage, very short passage, is pretty simple to break down. There's two major parts. There's a warning and there's a challenge. 
Jude most likely is a pastor who is writing to his church, and he's concerned by what he's seeing in, in his church. And so he writes this, and there's a warning, and there's a challenge. Now, before we get to this warning, Jude has gone through all sorts of uh, biblical history, Jewish history, Christian history, to talk about the dangers of false teachings, the dangers of people that misrepresent what the Bible says. That's why he says right here, but you must remember, beloved. So let's read, let's, that's the warning part. Let's look at the warning first. So let's reread 17 through 19. He says, but you must remember, beloved. And that's a very affectionate term that he's talking about, that God loves you. You're one of God's people. The predictions of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is they that cause divisions in the church. These people are worldly people. They do not have the Holy Spirit. They're not Christians. And they're saying things that are not Christ-like and not true. Pastor Don told me when he invited me to be with you today, he said I could preach on whatever the Lord lays in my heart. That's pretty difficult sometimes when you're coming in for one day because there's a lot of good stuff in here. It's hard to pick one passage. But I chose this passage because I am troubled by what I see today from some churches. Not all churches, but some. And some Christians. The danger in Jews' day, the false teachings that Jude was dealing with, they were people who were causing divisions within the church because they were teaching legalism, hedonism, and something called Gnosticism. Now, legalism basically taught you that you had to earn your salvation. They gave you a whole bunch of lists of do's and don'ts. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what Christ preached. Hedonism basically says, hey, worship pleasure. If it feels good, do it as long as it makes you happy. Does that sound familiar? It's not new. It's been around since day one. And you might be, you shouldn't be surprised. At it. That's not in the Bible either. And then Gnosticism is this really complicated thing that is probably worthy of its own sermon. You can ask Pastor Don about that. Um, it's very complicated, it's, and, uh, and, but it, did, it was starting, the seeds are starting to be planted in Jews' time. It's going to really come along later, and that's what John's going to write about. Um, the danger of all of these, or any other ism you want to throw out there, is that his church and Christians were allowing non-Christians who do not possess the Holy Spirit to dictate our worldview and determine how we live. You understand what I'm saying? The way we're supposed to live is what the Bible says. False teachers say, no, live this way. And if they don't have the Holy Spirit, and they're not Christians, they are, well, what Jude says, they're going to lead you astray. They're going to teach you to do things that are not biblical. And if you understand, world, a worldview is basically how you see the world. If you have to wear glasses, it's your paradigm. It's however you see the world. And my concern is that too many people, too many Christians, are allowing their glasses not to be made by the Bible and by God's truth, but by other sources. If you're here today, or if you're watching online, if you're a Christian... You do not belong to this world. This is not our home. This is temporary. It's just a rest stop on the way to eternity. So why, oh why, are so many of us living like some aspect of this world, this temporary rest stop, is the most important thing in our lives? I know why, and you know why too. Because too many of us spend most of our time in places other than the Bible. We spend too much time on social media. We spend too much time watching TV, if people still watch TV, streaming services, YouTube, the Gram, the TikTok. We spend way too much time doing that, Reddit. Twitter, the Facebook. We spend too much time on that and not enough time reading the Bible and praying. 
That's the bottom line. And I enjoy those things. I spent a lot of time yesterday watching some football games. I'm not going to lie to you. I have a Twitter account. It's ridiculous, but I have one. I have the Facebook. That's how people, that, you know, that's how, why some people were visiting today, because I posted, hey, I get to preach at Fort Willis. It's great. Come visit with me. Those are things are great, but they can't be number one. All right? They cannot be number one, and too many of us make it number one. And I hate to sound like a broken record, but those things, because if you, if you listen to any type of research, they'll tell you, but we just don't listen. Those things are poisoning our lives. They just, released a, they just released a study. Hey, Instagram is bad for body image in teen girls. Really? Shocker. Thank you for that research. Thank you for telling us something we should have already known. But we're being poisoned, especially on social media, because there you have something called keyboard courage, where you say things to people that you would never say in real life. And you know you wouldn't say in real life. Why? JC knows. And in those instances, it seems like every disagreement turns into an argument, and every argument turns into a clash of cultures, and every clash of cultures spreads more anger, fear, resentment. That is not how Christians are supposed to live. The church exists to celebrate and worship Christ, our Savior, our Creator. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name. That's, our, that's why we're here. You guys, Fort Lewis, you guys are about to embark on a very important journey that Pastor Don is helping you along with, calling a new pastor. Ever since Don told me about you guys, and he told me he was helping you, I was thrilled, because I'm your neighbor. We live up there in Cherokee Hills. I drive past you, go into the store, I drive back, going home. And ever since he's told me what's going on, I've been praying for you. Pretty much every time I drive by, I'm not going to say it's every time, but like either, the, either to or fro, I say a prayer. Lord, help Fort Lewis find the pastor you would have them to have. And that's my prayer for you. I want you guys to find a pastor who will preach unity, who will model grace, who will preach the Bible, and will, who, will lead you to continue to have the impact of the community that you guys already have and to make it even better. And to remember and to teach you what the church's job. The church's do- job, I says, to glorify Christ. Part of the way we do that is by being a light in the darkness. Part of the way we do that is not to judge. That's not our job. It's not to antagonize. It's not to condemn. You know whose job it is to condemn? It's not ours. It's the Lord's. That's the Lord's job, and we should not be doing his job. We should know our role and do what he's created us to be. We exist so that every man, woman, and child has multiple opportunities to see, hear, and respond to the gospel. The good news that Jesus loved you so much that he would die for you. And no matter how fervent a follower you are of fill-in-the-blank politician, musician, actor, coach, I guarantee you this, None of them would die for you. Let's be real. They don't even know who you are. You don't matter to them. So why do you put so much energy and time into following them? But God, who's the sovereign ruler of the universe, the creator of the universe, he does know you. He does know you. And he loves you, and too many of us ignore him. That's just not right, man. It's not right. So he's called us as a church, all Bible preaching, Jesus following churches working together. He's called us to make sure everybody knows that truth, that he knows us, he loves for us, loved us, and Jesus died for us. Why? To save us. Because we can't save ourselves. So, that's the warning. That's the heavy part. 
You got through it. Thank you. Now we get to the challenge. Because the, the natural question is, okay, if that's the warning, if that's what we want to be on guard against, then how do we do that? How do we make sure as a church we're doing our job? And Jude answers it. Let's reread verses 20 through 21. He says again, but you beloved, he's reminding you who you are. Beloved, you matter to God, but you beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. This is one of the tricky scenarios of translating Greek, which is what was the Bible was originally written in, that Jude originally wrote in, into English. In the Greek, verse 21 is actually first. And if you read it carefully, and I'm not an English teacher, I'm a, I used to be a history teacher, but I'm going to put my English teacher cap on for a second. If you read it carefully, there is only one imperative. There's only one command in those two verses. Keep. Keep is the only imperative. And what is it? It says what? Here's the order. It says keep yourselves in the love of God. That's the imperative. That's the command that Jude is telling us. That's how we answer the challenge to make sure we're being the church that God wants us to be. How? That's the three participles. Do you know what a participle is? Great. It's a verb that modifies the imperative, and it's a, and it's a continuous action. It means that the reason it's ing, building, praying, waiting, is because it's a continuous action. It's not one and done. Like eating, for me, is continuous. Some people feel me. So the key to living a fruitful Christian life is to keep ourselves in God's love. By building, praying, and worshiping. Now, I want, to make, I want to be clear what this is not saying. This is not saying that God's love will fail us. Absolutely, fundamentally, not true. It's impossible. God's love will never fail. In fact, it can't fail because the only reason we love God is because God first loved us. That's what the Bible teaches. Jude is basically saying, believers who take their eyes off the ball, like if you're trying to hit a tennis ball or a baseball, you have to watch the ball until it hits the bat or the racket. Believers who take their eye off the ball, God, their future hope in Christ, if you take your eye off of that, you're going to swing and a miss. And you're going to find that your love for God slowly evaporates and it's going to become obvious that your real love was for something else. That's a daily struggle that we should all deal with. That's what Jews warning about. That's what we're, we've already talked about. What's number one in your life? What's your priority? It should be Christ. If it's anything else, we need to address that. So let's look at how, let's look at the three participles that modify keep. First up is building. Jude is using construction as a metaphor for the Christian life. Have you ever built something? Then you know that HGTV lies. <laughs> the editing on those home improvement shows do not fully capture the long, tedious process of construction. A few years ago, I thought it would be a great idea to build something. Keep in mind, I'm not a handyman. No, no, no. Before this project, the most I ever built was Legos. But I had a great idea. My wife and I did together. I said, wife? She said, yes. That's not how it went. Our backyard was terrible. Our, our lot is terrible um, because it's, it's like this. And there's this little section from the house on the hill. We're like, hey, why don't we just build a deck that goes from the porch all the way to the steps? That won't be too hard. It was. And although I'm very happy with how the debt turned out, I wasn't very happy during construction. It took way longer than I thought it would. It was way harder than I thought it would be. And there were way, way, way too many trips to Lowe's. 
I still can't go into Lowe's. The only time I do, in case of emergency, a.k.a. my wife decides we need a new plant that's going to die shortly after we plant it. But see, if she wants it, she gets it. Building that deck is like the Christian life. The ending's great. The ending's outstanding. It's awesome. But the ending, we're get, we get to go to heaven. There's no, more, there's no more pain. There's no more tears. There's no more sin. That's awesome. But the process to get there isn't easy. It's not. That's one of the great lies that people devoid of the Holy Spirit will tell people. They'll say that, hey, once you become a Christian, your life is going to be bliss. And every day is going to be super happy, awesome fun with rainbows and sunshine and lollipops and all that fun stuff. That's just not true. For some, it might be. If you're, some of you are blessed and you're like, yeah, that's exactly how my life is. Great. Praise the Lord. For others, it's not that great. It's a difficult process. Uh, we are still going to struggle with sin. We are still going to experience hardships. We, are, we can still get hurt. And we are still going to make mistakes. We will never. Why? Because we will never fully be free from sin or the effects of sin on this side of eternity. It's just that's not what the Bible teaches. It's, now, once once Christ comes back, it's going to be great. We don't have to deal with that anymore. So, until that day, until Christ re returns, we have to build upon the foundation of our most holy faith. How? Well, to build anything, you have to have a blueprint and you have to have tools right? And, and resources, you know, materials. The blueprint is obvious for a Christian. It's the Bible. Believers keep themselves in God's love as their understanding increases through reading the Bible and listening to Bible-based preaching. Christian growth happens right here. It occurs in the mind. Yes, it happens in your heart as well, but God revealed it for you to read and to process and to learn from, it, growth happens here. He says, beloved, remember. Remembering is when you teach yourself over and over and over again everything you've ever learned until it's imprinted, until it's indented into your mind. So you just know it. So that's another hope I have for you, Fort Lewis, as you call a pastor. Make sure he preaches the Bible like Pastor Don does. Pretty awesome, right? Uh-huh, Amen. Make sure he preaches the Bible and not preaches self-help books. Don't want that. So the blueprints of the Bible are the tools. Well, the number one tool is the second part of, uh, part of simple, praying. Praying. Just like you can't hammer a screw, which I found out. It wouldn't go in all the way. I thought, hey, I can just finish off with a hammer nut. It doesn't work. What happens? It breaks off. Uh, you have to pray correctly. And can, can we, since we're such good friends now, can we just be real for a second? Some of our prayer lives are anemic. What do I mean by that? Do you only pray right before meals? It's great to praise God for the, providing you food and blessings, but if that's the only time you pray, that's not good. Do you only pray for yourself? God tells us he wants us to bring our fears, our worries, our struggles to him, but we should not treat God like a divine Santa Claus where we come with our wish list and we expect him to give us everything we ask for if we're good enough. That's not what the Bible teaches. Healthy prayer consists of praising God, confessing sin, praying for others, and then praying for yourself. To pray in the Holy Spirit, like Jude commands here, is an ongoing conversation with God. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, pray without ceasing. Now that doesn't mean you literally never stop praying, but it does mean that prayer should be a major recurring part of your life. Believers cannot keep themselves in the love of God like Jude is telling us to do if we're not regularly communicating with God in prayer. Here's proof. Have you ever been in a long-distance relationship? It doesn't have to be romantic. It can be friends. 
It can be parent-child. Maybe your child lives in another state now. Maybe your parents live where you moved off. You don't see each other every day, right? But what do you do if that person's important to you? You communicate with them. Back in my day, you had to write a letter. You said, no, no, you didn't. I said, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, and then we got the phone, a, an actual phone that was in the wall that she had to do this. And there was a cord that had to be like 15 feet long so you could take it in the other room. Nowadays, we got these computers that are in our pockets that just make it so easy that we can test immediately. We can video chat. We can do all kinds of stuff. But what's going to happen in that relationship if you're not communicating with that person? It's going to end. I have a lot of friends where I grew up. I don't talk to all of them. Which one? Guess which one? Guess which friends I'm still friends with? The ones I regularly communicate with. It's the same thing with God. All right? Christians, we are in a long distance relationship with God. You realize that, right? I mean, yes, we have the Holy Spirit, which makes it easier and is way better than trying to use a phone or write a letter or whatever. But we are still not in God's presence yet. And we will be, and that's going to be glorious, but we're not then. So until we get to be in his presence, we must communicate regularly. Because if not, the relationship's going to suffer. We must build up our faith by using the tool of prayer. So make sure your next pastor is a man of prayer, too. Which brings us to participle number three. Waiting. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Be patient in your search. I hope and pray it goes quickly. It might not. I'm just trying to be real. But be patient. Wait for who God has for you. This is going to be hard for you type A checklist people. I know you type A people. I'm married to one. This is hard. Waiting is hard. Yeah? Uh-huh. Yeah, it is. But here's something. Let's talk about, let's just get real. There is nothing you can do to earn the love of God. This is hard for type A checklist people. This is legalism, though. There is nothing you can do to earn the love of God. And there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation either. God doesn't love you because you read your Bible every day or pray the right way or because you're kind to others or because you always volunteer and you're generous through your resources. Now, we should do that. We should do all those things. That's what we've been talking about. But we don't do those things to earn God's love. This is the single biggest stumbling block for people both inside the church and outside the church. Those outside the church may think like this, and I've heard it said, there's no way God can love me. I've done this, or I've struggled with that. They'll say, you don't know what I've done. There's no way God can save me. Why would he even want to save me? Those inside the church sometimes think like this, man, God must really love me. You know why? Because I always volunteer, I always give money, I always read my Bible. I definitely, no doubt, must be saved. To both of these groups, I want to offer one simple reminder. Salvation and the love of God is not about what you do. Salvation is it's about what Jesus did. You could be the worst person in the world. I have news for you. You're made in the image of God, and Jesus died to rescue you from your sin. You could be the best person in the world. I have news for you. You're made in the image of God, but Jesus still had to die to rescue you from your sin. Because Isaiah 64 tells us that our most righteous acts, our best moments, guess what they're like to God? 
filthy rags. Because God's holiness that we sing about, we cannot fathom in our finite human minds. We can't fathom how holy God is. And if you don't fully understand God's holiness, you will never fully understand the depth of your sin. If you don't fully understand the depth of your sin, you will never appreciate what Christ has done for you. So if you're here today and if you're listening online, and if you think you're not good enough for God, you're right. But God still loves you, and God still wants to save you. That's the gospel. You don't have to clean up your life. So many people say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but i got to make some changes in my life. Because, no, you don't have to make changes in your life. You can't clean up your life. In verse 23, Jude describes our life apart from Christ, and it is not a pretty picture. If you look at it in the Greek, what, what verse 23 says is if you're apart from Christ, your life is like a dirty diaper. If you've ever changed a diaper, you know what I'm talking about. It's bad. But just like a baby can't clean themselves up after soiling themselves, you can't make yourself clean enough for God. Only Jesus can clean you up. Only Jesus can save you. And if you're here today and you've been a Christian for years and years, Please keep your heart on guard. Focus on Christ. Don't be distracted by this world or influenced by people that are not Christian. Don't let them be number one. And, and please, show mercy. That's what verse 22 says. He says, show mercy. The worst mistake a Christian or a church can make it's to think we're being faithful to the gospel because we spend all our time and energy attacking sinners. Sinners don't need to be attacked. Sinners need to be loved. But attacking them, judging them, condemning them, that's a sad, sad song. Jude offers us how to make it better in his closing benediction. I'm going to read it again. This is verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of God's glory with great joy. It literally is trying to answer the question that Psalm 8 asked. Remember Psalm 8 we read at the beginning? It said, who, who are humans that God is mindful of them? Another way to say it is, who are we or who can stand before God and God's holiness and his majesty and splendor? Here's the answer. Nobody can stand before God except for God, except for Jesus. That's who Jude is talking about right here. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, we're so thankful for who you are and what you've done. We marvel at you, your power, your majesty, your grace. We praise you that you know us, that we are not insignificant. Lord, if someone here today is hurting, they might be hurting physically, they might be hurting emotionally, spiritually. I pray that this truth that you know us, that you love us, will give them comfort. Lord, if someone here today is struggling with what they're currently going through, I pray that they take peace in your sovereignty. I pray that none of us forget that you are in total control of all aspects of your creation. You're not surprised by false teachings. You, that's, that's how Jews started. He said, don't be, remember, the apostle said this would happen. This is proof that you're in control. You know what's coming. It's impossible to surprise you. That's so awesome. Lord, if someone is here today and they have not trusted Christ to save them, I pray, I pray that you will shatter their pride. 
and let them realize their absolute need for you as a Savior. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We can't get to you, no matter how hard we try, no matter how good we live. But Lord, we praise you that we don't have to. You've done all that's necessary. You've loved us enough to die for us. Jesus, let us live for you. Lord, I pray for Fort Lewis. Thank you for what this church means. Thank you for what this church has done. Thank you for what this church will do for your kingdom. I pray for the pastor you will call to shepherd them. I pray that they will work together to continually bring more and more people to know you as Lord and Savior so that we can, we can rejoice with the angels in heaven. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. You can stand and join me. We're going to close the day with uh, just the chorus part of this well-known song. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. For He alone is worthy. few announcements to go over before you leave on this Sunday. Uh, first, we have some tomatoes out in the foyer. Uh, please help yourself to those. Uh, got plenty of them out there. Uh, baptism next Sunday. We're super excited and blessed to have uh, Colin and Kayla Brown uh, get baptized. Uh, so that's next Sunday. And then we will be having a meal out at the picnic shelter uh, to celebrate those baptisms. So please Sign up on the sign-up sheet as you exit out uh, the sanctuary. Um, you can sign up for main dishes, side dishes, desserts, all the above, all those great things. Uh, so please be sure to sign up there. Uh, fifth quarter, uh, as mentioned before, we have a fifth quarter coming up on Friday. There's also a sign-up sheet out there. Uh, I understand we're going to have a few of our normal starters not there Friday night, so we are definitely going to need some uh, extra volunteers. So please take the time to pray about that and, and sign up for that. If not, I have a phone directory, and I will be calling people, so <laughs> forewarned. <clears throat> uh, shoe boxes, uh, we still have shoe boxes out there. Um, uh, please take one and, and get one prepared. We'll be doing uh, dedication of that in mid-November. Uh, however, we do have a, a special thing coming up on October the 24th, um, a lady that i work with at VDOT. She has been to uh, Ukraine and Uganda to actually hand out the shoe boxes. So she's going to be here on the 24th to talk about her experiences, uh, take about 10 minutes of time of the worship that day to walk you through and help you understand <clears throat> on the, the back end of those things and tell about her experiences. So we're excited to have her here for that. Vision Virginia, you see the poster back there and there's a pamphlet and also an envelope. Um, a few weeks ago, we made the decision to affiliate with SBCV of Virginia, SBC of Virginia, and more closely with the Southern Baptist Convention. Regular contributions will be made by a church to missions through SBCV. Those will be the, those will be in our future budget, which about which you will hear more. <clears throat> we are already reaping benefits of our decision to join the group and are grateful to be a supportive partner church. In addition to this, there are special offerings that 
Southern Baptists in Virginia pray for and support. At Easter, we will be emphasizing mission work in North America through Annie Armstrong time of prayer, praying and offering. At Christmas, we will feature Lottie Moon time focusing on missions internationally. And here in the fall, for the first time because of our new partnership with SBCV, we'll be focusing on state missions through Vision Virginia. Next week will be the week of prayer, which is laid out in the brochure. And your gifts to Vision Virginia will help support our church planting efforts, disaster relief work, as you have seen some of that going on in the news here recently, as well as scholarships and internships. This is especially important for us at Fort Lewis Baptist because we are looking to have an interim <clears throat> um, intern next summer, and SBCV will be helping us through this offering to do so. So please pick up one and give a gift to support missions here in Virginia and beyond. So again, those are back there as you exit out the sanctuary. Our last announcement, and I kind of stand in between that, is uh, Dee LaFue is doing uh, her fundraiser today. She is cooking a bunch of amazing Filipino food. So you can go there and offer a donation. She is raising money for one of her churches that she sponsors in the Philippines uh, to buy a keyboard to add to their worship environment. Uh, so her address is 238 Butt Hollow Road. So if you do not have any lunch plans, head over to 238 Butt Hollow Road and get some amazing Filipino food and donate to a great cause to, to help out those churches. We did a video months ago. They're, <clears throat> they're using a lot of handmade instruments over there to, for their worship uh, time. So uh, this will be a great opportunity for us to help out that church and, and, to, and to bring an added benefit to their, um, their service time. So with that, that's all the announcements we have today. So let's conclude in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time of worship here today, Lord. We thank you for the challenge before us, Lord, uh, the warning from Jude that you wrote uh, through that author, Lord. We just um, pray, Lord, that we be on guard for that, and we be ready, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that this church continues to make an impact in this community, that we further your kingdom here in this area through these body of believers. Lord, we continue to lift up our pastor search team. As we're getting close to a, the next step, Lord, we just ask you, Father, just to be with that. Only you and the, the, through the Holy Spirit can connect the, the pastor you have set up before us uh, to, uh, through the search team in our church. Only your, your glory and power can do that. Lord God, we just uh, lift these fundraiser up to you, Lord. We just uh, pray that it's uh, um, profitable for, uh, to buy that keyboard for that church halfway across the world, Lord, that they continue to worship you and glorify you there and further your kingdom there. Lord God, we just uh, thank you for this day. We just ask you Lord, to be with us throughout this day and remain with us this week and, and bring us back again soon. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Have a great day.